My topic tonight is Revelations, Spiritual Revolution for a New Millennium. The year was 1993. A convoy of boats was streaming down a tributary leading into the one of the major rivers in the Philippines. There were three barges coming down this tributary before they came out into the large swollen waters of a larger river. These barges had large crucifixes on them and large shrines. It was the feast of the matrix of the crucifix. Hundreds and hundreds of Filipinos had gathered on those barges and they were worshiping that crucifix. As the barges came down through further villages, the villagers saw this holy profession, procession, they saw this holy ceremony, and they began swimming out, first five, first then 10, then 15, then 20, then 50, climbing aboard the barges to worship the crucifix. As they continued, as the procession continued down the river, more and more people swam out. But soon, there were too many people on the barges. Soon, the marshals tried to throw them off back into the water. But there were too many people. By now, hundreds were on these small barges. And the barges began to sink. They grasped at the crucifix. But it did not save them. And the barges sunk. And 300 bodies were laid out on the shore. Sinking barges. A religious service that did not support. I wonder, ladies and gentlemen, if it's possible to hold on to something in the name of religion, but it doesn't support you. I wonder if it's possible to be in a religious boat or barge called a church that might even sink when the troublous times of revelation come. Does God have a body of Christ that will support us? If he does, how can we identify that church or that body that is certain and solid? How can we find God's people and God's plan for our own lives in these last days? How can we discover God's truth? How can we be sure that the boat or church that we are sailing in will not sink because it takes in the waters of false doctrine and the waters of the world. One thing is for certain. There's a hunger for genuine Christianity in our society today. I find it every place I go in our meetings. I found it in Moscow, in the Kremlin Auditorium. I found it in Romania, in the Communist Congress Palace Hall that we had our meetings in. I found it in the Philippine International Cultural Center, the PICC, when we were there. I found it around the world, and I found it here, ladies and gentlemen, in Los Angeles. There's a hunger for spiritual things. There's a hunger for God in our world. There's a hunger to know and discover truth. And people of varying religious persuasions are longing for truth. They want to find not an earthly denomination. They want to find not some church with large buildings and fancy architecture and a minister in flowing robes with diamond rings on his hand. They want to find the truth of God. They want to find straightforward Bible preaching and teaching. They have a hunger in their hearts to know God and to know his truth. Materialism has not satisfied in the generation that we're living in, and it sent many people on a spiritual search. Pleasure has not satisfied in the generation that we're living in. You can only go to so many parties, you can only drink so much alcohol, you can only drink so much wine before you are saturated with loneliness and emptiness and alcohol does not satisfy and the nightclub scene does not satisfy and the pleasure scene whatever it is does not satisfy and technology has not satisfied men and women are looking they're seeking for longing and meaning and purpose there is this common hunger there is this spiritual longing there's an inner compulsion for something solid something that won't sink when we cling to it. Does God have a church 
on earth today? Does God have a people on earth called his church? Something that is solid? Does God have a people that are proclaiming his truth for the world today? Now, it would be strange if God did not have a people on earth today. Go back with me, please, to the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, God raised up a man, and he invited men and women to enter into the ark of safety, the ark of security. God's church in Noah's day was not a large church. It was not the popular majority. God invited men and women into the ark of safety or security in the days of Noah. In the days of Abraham, God had a man that would represent his love. God had a people that would represent his gracious, kind, compassionate character to the world. God called them from idolatry. God called them from worshiping false gods, and he called them to truth. And the Bible says, uh, Genesis 26, verse 2, Then the Lord appeared to him, to Abraham, and said, Do not go down to Egypt. In other words, be separate, distinct, reveal my loving character. Live in the land of which I shall tell you. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. The Bible says, Abraham obeyed my statutes, my commandments, my laws. In the days of Noah, God had a group of people that loved him, that believed his law was the way of freedom. His law was the way of liberty. In the days of Abraham, God had a group of people that loved him, that were a special people called out to God. In the days of the nation of Israel, God said, I desire to have your, my character revealed through Israel. And here in the days of Israel, God had a special people. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 11, verse 1, Therefore you shall love the Lord your God. Isn't that the first characteristic of being part of God's people, loving the Lord your God, isn't it? The Bible says, therefore you shall love the Lord your God. And it goes on, and keep his charge, his statutes, his judgments, and his commandments always. In the days of the Old Testament, God had a group of people. They were called the Israelites. They loved him. They revealed his character. They believed that his law and his commandments were the way of freedom, the way of abundant life, and the way of happiness. You come to the New Testament. God raises up a man by the name of Peter. And the Bible says, as it calls out, about a special people. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Read it with me, please. But you are a chosen generation. A what? Royal priesthood. A holy nation. His own special people. Ladies and gentlemen, did God have a special people in the New Testament? Did he? Did God have a special people in the days of Noah? He did. Special people in the days of Abraham? He did. A special people in the days of Israel? He did. A special people in the New Testament? The Bible says God chose them. They were a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a special people. That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God called them out of something into something, out of darkness, out of confusion, out of rebellion, out of sin, out of law breaking, into the light of God's truth, the light of God's love, into the light of obedience. All through the Bible, God's always had a special people, and that special people are called his church throughout the centuries. God has men and women who've been faithful to him. You see, in the Bible, it's not that there are many ways to heaven. It's not that there are various denominations that all take us to the same place. In the Bible, God reveals his truth in his special people. Now, often in a series like this, I have people say to me, but Pastor Finlay, I have a question. And here's what my question is. I cannot deny my heritage. I, I've been a Baptist for 40 years. I can't deny that. I can't say that's all wrong. I've been a Catholic for all my life. I can't turn my back on that. I've been a Methodist or a Pentecostal. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I thank God for my heritage. I did not choose to be born in a loving Roman Catholic home. I didn't choose my early childhood upbringing. 
it was in the divine providence of God that God knew that he would lead me that way. So when I look back on my Catholic background, it's not something that I say, oh, that background was all bad. That's the way God happened to lead me. When I followed truth and became a Bible-believing, Sabbath-keeping Adventist Christian, I did not give up anything true from my background. I just exchanged the errors that I once believed for further truths that God has given me in the Bible. So if you have been a Baptist for 40 years, you're not disowning what you were. God has led you as a Baptist. That's the channel God led you in. But you are so honored by God now and so loved by God, he's revealed the special truths of the Bible Sabbath because he wants you to be part of his special people. So when we take further steps in truth, we are not disavowing our past. When we take further steps in truth, we're accepting that God keeps leading us on. We're praising God because we're saying, God, you have led me in the past, but you are even giving me more light, and when you give me light, I'm going to follow. Now, here's an eternal principle in finding a church. Here's an eternal principle. You do not go to the church to find the truth. You go to the Bible to find the truth. Now, if you go to the church to find the truth, you have to go to 1,800 different churches because they all say they have the truth. So, you don't go to the church to find the truth, you go to the Bible to find the truth. And, when you find the truth, you look for a church that teaches the truth. So, you go to the Bible to find the truth, and as you find the truth in the Bible, you say, where is there a church that squares with that truth which I have found from the Bible? 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, God defines the church. He says, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God. What's the house of God? The church. And then he goes on to say, which is the church of the what? Living God, the pillar and the ground of what? The truth. So God's church is the pillar and ground of the truth. James Milner makes this incredible statement in his book, Religious Controversy. He says, page 95, there is but one inquiry to be made, namely, which is the true church? By solving this one question, you will at once solve every question of religious controversy that has ever been or that ever can be agitated. Milner says, once you understand how to identify God's church from the truth of the Bible, and you understand what the Bible says about those steps to take to find the true church, you'll have every question answered about truth. How do you find the true church in the Bible? Well, there's one thing for certain. It wasn't Jesus' intent to have all these different denominations. John 17, verse 21 says that they all may be what? one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you. It was not Jesus' intent that Christians be fragmented. It wasn't Jesus' intent that the Christian church be divided. He said that they all may be one. Christ envisioned one united Christian church, not all these different denominations that would rock the world. But what was the basis upon which that church would be united? John 17, verse 17 says, read it with me, please. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So what's the basis of this unity? Truth. So it was Christ's intent that his church always preach his word and be faithful to his truth and be one in the world. Well, somebody says, can you know the truth? Isn't it a matter of opinion? Jesus said in John 8, verse 32, and you shall, what's the next word, everybody, what? Know the truth, and the truth shall make you what? Free. Can you know the truth? Indeed, Jesus says, you shall know the what? Truth. And the truth shall make you free. The Apostle Paul writes that we can know truth. And when we know truth, the body won't be divided. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 25 says that there should be no schism. What's a schism? division in the body. So Christ wants his church to be one. He wants it unified on truth. 
And the reason he wants that is so the body isn't divided. But the apostle also predicted that false religious teachers would arise. And it says in Acts 20, verse 30, also from your own selves, he's talking to the apostles, he's talking to religious leaders, men will rise up speaking perverse, that is crooked, that is counterfeit things, to draw away disciples after themselves. Now put these texts together. Jesus said, I want my church one. He said, I want it united on truth. He said, I don't want divisions in the body. But he said, in reality, men are going to rise. They're going to teach their own things. They're going to get away from the purity of the faith. They're going to get away from the truth of the word. They're going to get away from truths that reveal the loving, beautiful character of God. And he says, in the last days, he would raise up a movement, a divine movement of destiny that would restore those truths again. In the book of Revelation, it describes a powerful presentation from eternity in the past to the last days that reveals the identifying characteristics of God's last day movement. One of the most thrilling chapters in all the Bible is Revelation chapter 12. And here in Revelation 12, a woman appears in heaven. Now let's look at what the Apostle Paul says about the bride of Christ, the woman. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. For I am jealous with you with godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband. Now God says to his bride, to his church, I've, you are engaged to one husband. You're married now to one husband. Never leave that husband. Then he goes on to say, that I may present you, that is the church, as a chaste virgin to Christ. So the church is a virgin, united, engaged to Christ to have one lover. The church is pictured as a beautiful woman. Revelation chapter 12 pictures her that way. Now in Revelation 12 there are four episodes. It's like a play with four scenes. Scene number one, a dragon in heaven, Satan, attacks the heavenly beings. He says, God, you're unfair. God, you're unjust. We don't have to obey God. And he leads angels into rebellion. That's scene one. Revelation 12, verse 9. So the great dragon was cast out. Who's the dragon? That serpent of old called the what? Devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. So Satan battles against God in heaven. And the Bible says he was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Scene one, there is a battle in heaven. Lucifer and his angels are cast out of heaven. In scene one, God wins and Satan loses. In every one of these scenes, God wins and Satan loses. There may be a battle tonight in your life over truth. There may be a vicious battle in your life that you're struggling with some habit struggling with some practice. There may be a war going on inside of you tonight, but thank God the God that cast Satan out of heaven can cast Satan out of your life. In battle number one, scene number one, God wins and Satan, what everybody? Loses. Scene number two, Satan comes to earth. Revelation 12, verse 4, centuries go on. The dragon stood before the woman. The woman represents what? The church that was ready to give birth. The New Testament church would be launched. The Old Testament church would give birth to the Christ, the Messiah, to launch the New Testament church, to devour her child as soon as it was born. So Satan, the dragon, stands before the woman the New Testament church is going to be born. Christ is going to be born. Jesus the Messiah. And it says here that the devil is there. Revelation 12, verse 5. She, the church, bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Who is the male child that was going to rule all nations with a rod of iron? Who is that? Jesus. The Old Testament church is fading away. The New Testament church is coming on the scene. Here you have the bride of Christ. Now notice. The Bible says that Satan is angry, Satan's vicious. What does he do? He tries to destroy the church, but ultimately, Revelation 12, verse 5, he tries to destroy Christ. It says her child was caught up to God in his throne. How did Satan 
try to destroy Jesus when Jesus was just born. Herod passed a decree that all male children under two years old be killed. Satan, the dragon, tried to destroy the male child at his birth. The wise men came to the home of Mary and Joseph, and those wise men brought gold and frankincense and myrrh. And that wealth was used to finance a trip down into Egypt. Satan lost. Jesus won. His family took the young child down to Egypt. But Satan came back again and tempted Christ throughout his life. He tried to kill Christ in the wilderness. He brought Jesus up on a high temple and said, throw yourself down. Jesus said, it is written that God alone shall we serve. And here, again, Satan lost. Jesus won. On a cross called Calvary, before the whole universe suspended between heaven and space, Satan tried to destroy Christ with nails in his hands and a crown of thorns upon his head, blood running down his face. Satan wanted to do away with Jesus. Satan wanted the guilt of all the world and his sins to take away his life forever. But hallelujah, the Christ that went into the tomb came out of the tomb. And the Bible says that when Jesus came out, Revelation 12, verse 5, her child was caught up to God and his throne. Jesus was resurrected to heaven. Scene number two. Satan does not destroy Christ. Jesus dies. He goes into the tomb. He's resurrected. He ascends to heaven. Throughout the centuries, Satan now turned his wrath on the woman, the Christian church. He couldn't do anything to Jesus. Jesus was triumphant. Jesus was resurrected. All of the, of the disciples, except one, died a martyr's death. The first and second century, the sands of Rome and the sands of Europe and the sands of Asia Minor and the sands of the Middle East were blood-stained sands as thousands of Christians died. Ultimately, Constantine, the pagan Roman emperor, was baptized. He signed a decree. Church and state were united. There was a short moment of peace for Christianity. But then compromise entered in Falsehood came into the church, the great dark ages period, church and state united. And notice what the Bible says. Great numbers, that is of Christians, were driven from their habitations with their wives and their children. The book, The History of the Popes, volume 2, page 334, they were stripped naked and many of them inhumanely massacred dark ages. Where was God's church during the dark ages? Here it is, Revelation 12, verse 6. Then the woman, what's the woman, everybody? The what? Church fled into the what? Wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God. Now follow me closely. This is Christian history. Scene one, Satan rebels against God in heaven. Satan's cast out of heaven. God wins, Satan loses. Centuries go by, scene two, Satan tries to destroy Jesus Christ as a baby. Satan tries to destroy Jesus through his life. Satan tries to destroy Jesus on a cross. Christ is resurrected from the dead. God wins, Satan loses. Scene three, Satan focuses on the church. He tries to destroy it. It's the dark ages, scene three. But there is a place prepared by God in the wilderness, and his faithful followers flee to the northern part of Italy, through France. They hide in secret caves. They hide in wilderness areas. Ladies and gentlemen, every time Satan brings his wrath upon God's people, the church, God wins and Satan loses, and there is a place prepared by God. Are you facing some trial tonight in your life? You facing some difficulty in your life? You facing some heartache in your life? Facing some challenge in your life? There is a place prepared for you of refuge and security by God. How long would the church be in the wilderness? Revelation 12, verse 6, that they should feed her there 1,260 days. How long is 1,260 days? How long is that? Well, in Bible prophecy, one prophetic day equals one what? Literal year. So 1,260 prophetic days equal 1,260 literal what? Years. Ezekiel 4, 6 says, I've given you a day for a year. Numbers 14, 34 says, I've given you a day for a year. 
Doesn't it make sense, ladies and gentlemen? Church and state unites and is dominant on the throne for 1260 years. The church of God, his true faithful believers, are in the wilderness for 1260 years. While the fallen church state union is united and ruling on the throne, God's people are in hiding for that period of time. What happened? 538 AD, the pagan Roman Empire gave civil and religious authority to the Pope of Rome. Justinian, the pagan Roman Emperor, gave it to Vigilus II of Rome. 538 AD, the papacy began to reign. The Dark Ages begin. The Middle Ages begin. Church and state unite. God's people are in the wilderness for 1260 years, as the Bible says. It comes to 1798. Europe has been divided. The Franks took over the area we now know as France. God's people during this time, the church were in the wilderness. The church state union existed for that 1260 year period. At the end of the 1260 years, God would move powerfully. The reformers during that 1260 years were persecuted for their faith. You had men like John Huss, men like John Wycliffe, Men like Jerome burned at the stake. Great men of God like Martin Luther who defended God's word. They had partial light. They had partial truth. They were all part of that church in the wilderness. All part of that group that were looking for, seeking for truth. But in 1798, Napoleon, ruling in France, looked to the south. He was threatened by the Pope of Rome. So he sent down his general Berthier to take the Pope captive. You can read it in history books. And in 1798 exactly, 538 A.D. to 1798 A.D. 538 A.D., the papacy comes to preeminence. It comes to prominence when Justinian gives the Pope of Rome his authority. 1260 years later, 1798, Napoleon comes down, takes the Pope captive. For 1260 years, the church would be in the wilderness. The church would be in hiding. God would stir the minds of honest-hearted men and women. God would reveal Bible truth. But after 1798, God would raise up a movement. God would move to restore all the truths that would be lost sight of. In scene three, the church is in the wilderness, but God wins, Satan loses. Satan does not destroy the church and the flame of truth and the torch of truth that was carried by faithful reformers now bursts into a great flame in God's end time movement. The Bible says, Revelation 12, verse 17, last scene, and the dragon. Who is the dragon, everybody? Satan and the dragon was enraged. What does the word enraged mean? Angry with the woman. Who is the woman? Who's that? The church and goes to make what? War with the rest of her offspring. Wait a minute, we're in the last days now. This is the last scene. And Satan sees a church and he sees the woman's offspring. The pure faith of the New Testament. This woman who had pure doctrines, this bride of Christ in the New Testament, she has offspring, she has children down here. In the last days, there is a remnant those that remain loyal and faithful and true, and God gathers them into one identifiable movement. How do you describe God's last day movement? This remnant. 12 verse 17 says, who keep the commandments of God and have the what? Testimony of Jesus Christ. Here is a Bible-believing movement. Here is a movement that is filled with grace, the grace of Christ. Here is a movement that keeps the commandments of God. Just like Noah, a called out people. Just like Abraham, a called out people. Just like the Israelites of old, spiritual Israelites, a true church, a called out people. Just like New Testament believers, a special people. God calls out his people. Like he called out men and women down through the ages, he calls out his people, a Bible-believing people, a people that uplift Jesus Christ, a people that keep the commandments of God because they love Christ, a people that have the testimony of Jesus. The dragon is angry with that people. 
The dragon tries to destroy that people, but the Bible says they do what, everybody? Let's read it together from the screen. They do what? Keep the commandments of God. Saved by grace, they love Christ and are led to obedience. Their hearts are committed to God. Their minds are committed to God. Sure, they stumble. Sure, they fall. No, they are not perfect in their lives, but their hearts are committed. They are committed to follow Christ. They are committed to obey Christ. Deep within the fabric of their being, they have one desire, and that is to please God. The Bible says they also have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now notice their two characteristics. It says they keep the commandments of God. The first commandment says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. They make Christ first in their life. Second commandment says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. They don't come to God through pagan images, and they don't come to God through images of the saints. No images in that church at all. The Bible says that thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. They don't misrepresent Jesus by teaching that it's okay to break his law. Neither is this a church that defiles the name of Jesus in the sense of cursing and swearing. These are transparent, real Christians. They say they are Christians and they live a Christian life. They don't take his name in vain. It, this is a people that keep the commandments of God. They exalt the seventh day Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Here is a Bible-believing, grace-centered movement that God has called out, a movement that's to keep his commandments. It's the bride of Christ. It's a church, a movement that leads men and women back to keeping the seventh day Sabbath. God said, remember, and the majority of the world has forgotten it. Here's a movement that exalts the commandments of God. It leads men and women away from breaking God's commandments. It teaches them the importance of honesty, thou shalt not kill. It teaches them the importance of, rather, thou shalt not bear false witness. It teaches them the importance of refraining from anger and bitterness and resentments. It teaches them to respect the sanctity of life, thou shalt not kill. It teaches them purity, thou shalt not commit adultery. It uplifts the positive Christian values of purity and honesty and integrity and truthfulness. See, every commandment is not negative, it's positive. The commandment that says thou shalt not commit adultery is a commandment that says keep your mind pure. The commandment that says thou shalt not steal is a commandment that says respect your neighbor's goods. The commandment that says thou shalt not kill is a commandment that says be in control of your emotions and don't let anger get in control of you. The commandment that says thou shalt not bear false witness is a commandment that says be truthful and respect your neighbor. You see, here is a grace-filled church. Here is a divinely ordained movement of God. Here is a movement that exalts Christ. Here is the bride of Christ. Here is a commandment-keeping people that recognize that God's commandments speak freedom, that God's law speaks liberty. Here is not a legalistic, narrow-minded body, but here is a group of people that believe living obediently is the happiest, most joyful, way to live. Don't you believe that tonight, ladies and gentlemen, that the happiest way to live is a way of obedience, a way of joy, a way of commandment, keeping not a way of commandment, breaking this movement of God, the Bible says. There are two things about it. It leads men and women to keep God's commandments. Secondly, the Bible says it has the testimony of Jesus Christ. I wonder, what's this mean, the testimony of Jesus? A testimony has to do with the witness. What's the testimony of Jesus Christ? Well, let's look at the text. Revelation 12, 17 says they have the what? Testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation 19, 10 says the testimony of Jesus is the what? Spirit of prophecy. So here is a movement that recognizes and acknowledges spiritual gifts. If we're going to discover the true church today, and if we go by the Bible, we have to find a movement that believes in the gift of prophecy in the last day church because the Bible says 
that they have the testimony of Jesus, Revelation 12, 17, and it says again, Revelation 19, 10, reading together, the testimony of Jesus is the what? Spirit of prophecy. In fact, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter, rather 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7, so that you come behind in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation or the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now on Friday night, we'll be talking about the true and false gift of prophecy. We'll be talking about the gifts of the Spirit in the church and how you can tell the difference between the true and the false. But ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says the church before the coming of Christ is going to come behind in no gift. God is going to lavish spiritual gifts upon his church, and we'll talk about that Friday night. But Jesus says, when you find this body of believers that is based on the Bible and loves me and is a commandment-keeping movement, Jesus made this commission, he said, Matthew 28, verse 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Now here is a movement that's to rock the world and go to how many nations, everybody? How many? All nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Here is an international movement where God is leading people to be baptized into that international movement. Teaching them, teaching all people to observe all things that I've commanded you. He says, go, teach my commandments. Lead people to Christ when they become Bible-believing Christians, don't leave them, baptize them. Let them become part of Sabbath-keeping, Christ-centered, Bible-believing, Adventist fellowships around the world. Something that's more than a denomination, but a divine movement of God with organized churches that are influencing the world. And Jesus says, Lo, I am with you always, even to the what? End of the age. Until the end of the age, men and women would be seeking for truth. To the end of the age, men and women would be looking for a Bible-based church. To the end of the age, men and women would be looking for a church that uplifted Christ. To the end of the age, men and women would be looking for an Adventist people waiting for the hope of the Advent and the coming of Christ. To the end of the age, God would be leading truth seekers back to his commandments, back to his Sabbath. And God has a last day message for every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. God gives a last day message in Revelation chapter 14 that summarizes clearer than any place in the Bible, the teachings of God's last day message, the teachings of God's last day church. Here it is, summarized in six verses in the Bible. Revelation 14, verse 6. Then I saw another angel fly in the middle of heaven. You say to a pastor, Pastor, what does it mean the angel flies in heaven? What are these three angels' messages? Three angels fly one after the other. Most Protestant pastors will say to you, I'm really not sure. Not sure of the most important messages that God has given to humanity in this generation? What if Noah said, I'm not sure? Did God tell me to build an ark or not? What if Abraham said, I'm not sure? What if John the Baptist said, I'm not sure of the message about the Messiah. What if Paul said, I'm not sure? Here is a message that's clear. Let's notice it phrase by phrase. An angel flies in mid-heaven. An angel flies, an urgent message for the last days that God gives, having the everlasting gospel. Here's the first thing we know about God's true church. It will preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. It will exalt Jesus. No other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. We're saved through the blood. We're saved by grace. We're saved as we reach out in faith. It's the gospel. To preach to those that dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. It cannot be a non-denominational church. It must be a movement of God, a movement of destiny that goes to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. It cannot be predominantly a white church because 90% of the world is non-white. It cannot be a predominantly of any one ethnic group. It must have Africans in it. It must have Spanish South Americans in it. It must have Indians in it. It must have Asians in it. It must have an totality because God has made of one blood all nations and God is not partial to one race. So here is a message, ladies and gentlemen, that must go to the entire world. A message with an open door for all peoples. The Bible says that that message goes to the world. It says, what is the message? Fear God. 
Does that mean be afraid of God? No, it does not. It means to bow down before God in reverential awe and obey God. It says, give glory to Him. How do you give glory to God? The Bible says, whatever you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. The Bible says, do you not know, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, first text, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, the second text. Know you not that your body is the temple of God. You're bought with a price. Ladies and gentlemen, God's true message for the last days of earth's history must lead people to present their bodies as a living sacrifice to God. We are physical, mental, and spiritual. So here is a Bible-based movement. Here is a grace movement. Here is a cross movement. Here is a movement leading people back to obedience as the happy way of life. Here is a movement that goes to the ends of the earth to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying reverentially, bow before God and obey Him. Here is a movement that says, with your bodies, give glory to God. Be free from promiscuity and immoral sexual relations. God says, give them your body. God says, be free from drugs and alcohol and unclean foods. And then the Bible says, for the hour of his judgment is come. The hour of what? His judgment. Here is a message that says, no longer business as usual. Here is a message that says, we are not our own gods. Here is a message that says, before God, we have accountability. The hour of God's judgment not will come in the future, but it has come. Here is a message that says, that we are morally responsible for our choices. Here's a message that says the hour of God's judgment has come. That message goes on. Worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Here is God's last day message. And who's the one that made heaven, earth, sea, and the fountains of waters? He's the what? The creator. So here is a message calling men and women back to worship the creator. And how do we worship the creator? On the Sabbath. Revelation 14, 7, worship him that made heaven, earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. It's a quote from the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath. For in six days the Lord made heaven, earth, sea, and all that in this. So Revelation 14 calls you to worship the Creator on the Sabbath. So God's Bible-based, grace-centered, cross-centered, Christ-centered last day movement, calling men and women to keep the commandments of God, leading them back to the principles of health has to be a Sabbath-keeping movement in the light of the judgment hour. And God is calling all peoples of every denomination to it. The second angel flies. First angel tells you what the message is. Second angel says, Revelation 14, verse 8, another angel followed saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. God says, Babylon is fallen. God says, come out of all the Babel and the religious confusion. God says, come out of those churches that you've only learned part of the truth in. God says, she's made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Men and women have drunk the wine of false doctrine, and they are confused. And here's the second angel's message. Now, here's something to try, and your pastor, if he's not a Seventh-day Adventist pastor, go to your pastor and say, Pastor, clearly explain to me. God gave three angels flying in the middle of heaven. This is the last message of warning for the world. It says so here in the Bible that Christ is going to come. What does the first angel's message mean, Pastor? What does that mean? It says, fear God and give glory to Him. The hour of His judgment has come. What does it mean that Babylon has fallen and God is calling us out of it? What does that mean? And most pastors say, well, I'm not quite sure why this commentator says this and that commentator says that. I thank God for a clear message that says Babylon is fallen. The religious churches of our day that are Sunday-keeping churches may have wonderful Christians in them, some wonderful Christians. Most churches have some people that are totally committed to Christ and others that are half committed and some that are not committed. They just warm a place in the pew, that's all. But I acknowledge that many people of Sunday-keeping churches are wonderful Christians. But God says Babylon has fallen. God says that system has imbibed error. And God says, come out of her, my people. Notice what the Bible says. Revelation 18, verse 4, I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. God has his people in every religious communion. And he says, I'm making a call to my last day church. Come out of her, my people, lest you share of her sins and you receive her plagues. God, in the second angel's message, is calling his people out of religious error and apostasy. And that last message of the angel says in Revelation 14, verse 9, 
the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, now notice these messages must be important. They're angelic messages from God, and they say with a loud voice, notice it here, if anyone worships the beast at his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. The first angel's message says, Exalt Jesus, obey God. The first angel's message says, give your God your body as the temple of the Holy Spirit. The first angel's message says, we're in the judgment hour, worship the Creator. The second angel's message says, come out of all the churches that are not preaching the gospel, not preaching the Bible, not preaching the second coming of Christ that we're living in the judgment hour, not preaching the message of health that your body's the temple of God, not preaching the Sabbath message, the third angel's message says, we are going to face the mark of the beast, a human sign of authority, a human day of worship substituted. God says, my true church will be proclaiming these three messages to the world. Now, ladies and gentlemen, tonight, I am not a Seventh-day Adventist because I was born one. My mother and father, my father was a Protestant Christian, my mother a Catholic Christian. I was brought up in a lovely Catholic home. I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist tonight because either my mother or father were Seventh-day Adventists. Nobody in my family were Adventists initially in their lives. Dad became an Adventist later in his life. I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist because it was the largest church in our community. It was a very small church, 30, 40 people back in those days meeting in a rented room, didn't have, even have its own church building. I am not a Seventh-day Adventist because it was the most popular church. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist tonight because as I've studied the Bible and examined what the Bible says, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the only denomination that I could find that fit in with these characteristics. Here they are. The Bible says in one, two, three fashion to make it so simple. See, it's not complicated. God makes it simple. Here are the identifying characteristics of God's church directly from the Bible. Number one. God's church would recapture the pure faith of the disciples. God's church would be a Bible-based church. Can you say amen? amen? Number two, God's church would have the dual characteristics. This is the bride of Christ of Revelation 12, 17. It would keep the commandments of God, and it would have the testimony of Jesus are guided by the gift of prophecy. The Seventh-day Adventist church is Bible-based. The Seventh-day Adventist Church loves Christ and leads people to keep the commandments of God. It has the wonderful guidance, as we'll study Friday night, of the gift of prophecy. Thirdly, this, the true church must be a worldwide mission-driven movement of every nation, tongue, and people. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is in over 200 countries in the world. It's one of the fastest-growing Protestant denominations in the world. Thousands are coming to Christ and being baptized. Revelation 14, 7 says it will be a mission-driven movement. It will call people to total commitment to Christ. Revelation 14, 7 says, fear God. Fall on your knees. Give your lives totally to Christ. It's a church that calls for commitment in an age of lack of commitment, in an age where many people say, oh, do I have to give up that? Oh, do I have to give up that? And many churches apologize for high standards. Seventh-day Adventists still believe in the standards of God, and we still call people for commitment to Christ and separation from the world to reveal before the world the light of the glory of God. In some churches, you cannot tell the difference between the world and the church. But here is a movement, and I'll tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, men and women of honest hearts, men and women that really want to know Christ, they're not looking for some half-baked Christianity. The young people of our generation, and I'm talking to young people right now, you don't want some watered-down Generation X gospel. What you're looking for in your heart is something that challenges you to the core. What you're looking for in your heart is something you can give your life to. Something that's worth standing for. Something that's worth committing to. What you're looking at it for is something big and something grand and something great. And that's the Advent movement today. It's going to the world to rock it. And it needs every young person to make a commitment to Christ, to participate in the great movement of God in these last days. God's true people will lead people to the Bible Sabbath. 
in an age of evolution, God's true movement says there is still a creator God in this world. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist today because it's a worldwide mission movement. Because it's leading people to total commitment to Christ and it doesn't apologize for that. Because it's leading people back to the Bible, Sabbath, the creator of God. God's movement will encourage people to give their bodies to him. The message says, fear God and give glory to him. And what you eat and drink, I'm an Adventist, because it has a complete message. Not only a message for the soul, but a message for the body as well. Body, mind, and spirit. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist tonight. Because it makes an appeal for truth. It makes an appeal to step out. It calls for courage. You see, God's church is not in the majority because you can never base truth on a majority vote. You never take a vote and say, what's truth? In Noah's day, the majority was outside the ark, swept away with the flood. In Abraham's day, majority outside the ark, outside the ark of safety, outside the hands of God. Israel's day, majority heathen nations. Jesus' day, the majority said, crucify him, crucify him. You can never base truth on a majority vote. God's church is not in the majority. God's church is not the most popular because truth rarely wins a popularity contest. God's church is not the most spectacular because God values truth more than architecture. God values truth more than ornate buildings. God values truth more than spectacular cathedrals. So God's church is not the most spectacular. God values truth more than architecture. God's church does not need the approval of popular religious leaders. I've had people say to me, oh, but why doesn't pastor so-and-so preach this if it's true? Why doesn't reverend so-and-so preach this if it's true? Why doesn't the bishop preach this if it's true? Since when did God go to a religious leader to get endorsement for truth? God's church does not need the approval of popular religious leaders because truth is truth whether religious leaders accept it as truth or not. Can you say amen? amen. Truth is truth. You don't have to take a vote from some preacher. You don't have to take a vote from some bishop. Truth has enough stuff to stand on its own two legs, ladies and gentlemen. Truth can stand up for itself. Truth is truth, whether religious leaders accept it or not. And the only safety is not to say, what's the biggest church? What's the most ornate church? Where did the majority go? What's the most popular church? The only safety to say is, what did Jesus teach? What did the Bible teach? And when you find that, truth beckons us to follow it. Truth appeals to us to follow it. Truth burns into our soul. Truth frees our mind from error. Truth demands that we take a stand. James Russell Lowell put it this way, truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. But that scaffold sways the future. And behind the dear unknown standeth God, keeping watch above his own. Some time ago, I met a religious leader. I will not tell you his name. He happened to be a bishop of the denomination that he was a bishop in, not a Catholic bishop, but a bishop. And he came to me and he said, Pastor, let me tell you a story. He said, about a year and a half ago, I was celebrating communion one Sunday. And after communion, a lady stood up and she said, Bishop, I have a question. And here's my question, Bishop. Would you show me the scripture in the New Testament that says specifically that Jesus changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday? He said, ma'am, because that question is asked me from time to time in my last 40 years of ministry, next Sunday I'll preach on it. He told me, Pastor, I studied all week. I couldn't find it. So I came into the pulpit and I said, Folk, give me another week. I'll preach on it next week. He said, I studied all week. And he said, the longest journey I ever took in my life 
was from my pastor's study to the pulpit that Sunday morning. And he said, I'm awfully sorry, but I couldn't find that scripture. And as I've been studying the Sabbath, I feel the call of truth. I need to step out myself. He studied for six months the Sabbath question. And today, he has taken his step. He has been baptized as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian and is preaching the Sabbath of Christ because he believes that he heard truth and that God was calling him to follow it. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight, how many of you in this lecture series can say, I have heard truth and I believe God's called me? Can I see your hands? You've heard truth. You believe that God has called you. Many of you have walked through the water of baptism. How many of you tonight want to say, Jesus, I believe I've heard truth. I've not walked through the water of baptism, but I'm just going to wave my hand. I'm looking forward to it this Friday night, this Sabbath, or some other time. Can I just see your hand? You're looking forward to it. Praise God. Look at these hands. Keep them up, folks. Look at these hands. How many want to join these just by raising your hand tonight? You're saying, I've heard truth. I know truth. And I praise God. I want to follow it. Anybody here tonight once walked with the Adventist communion? You once were a part of the Adventist people, but you drifted away. Maybe you got involved with an independent Adventist organization, something not part of the main body of Christ. Maybe you became critical. Maybe you became bitter. Maybe, just maybe, you were once an Adventist, but you left Christ and you drifted away for some reason, didn't live in harmony with God's Word. And tonight you want to say, Pastor, God's knocking on the door of my heart. I once was part of this people and I drifted away. Whatever church you're in, wherever you are tonight, but you say, God's calling me. I want to be something, part of something big, something great for God. If you once were an Adventist, you believe God's calling you back again to this family, this family of truth, this family that will put its arms around you and love you, this family, a worldwide family. You drifted away and you say, God, I want to be rebaptized. I want you to raise your hand right now. Just raise it. God bless you. God bless you. Wherever you are, God bless you. Because until then... We can hang on till Christ comes. We can walk on till Christ comes. Listen as Jennifer sings. Oh! 
whatever trials you go through here, whatever obstacles that the devil puts in our way, Jesus is stronger, Jesus is greater, and it's going to be worth it all. Because in the final analysis, God is going to win. And Satan is going to lose. That is certain. Tonight, there are so many here in the Sequoia Center, hundreds that have made decisions for baptism. Our pastors are working carefully to answer each one's questions and prepare each one. And across America, there are thousands that have made this decision to follow Christ in baptism. Or many Adventists who once knew Christ and drifted away, they're coming back, coming back by the hundreds. They realize that this is the last days and God is gathering them in. Now look, wherever you are tonight, whatever church you are in, if you're preparing for baptism, that's fine if you've counseled with your pastor. If you haven't, pastor, wherever you are, come to the front tonight. Talk with any who may have made decisions tonight whose names you don't have. Here in the Sequoia Center tonight, if you're already registered for baptism, you checked the card, came forward, you have a date you're preparing, that's fine. Go and rejoice and sing thankfulness to God. But tonight, if we've missed anybody, if you've raised your hand tonight to come back, if you don't have a pastor sitting down preparing a date with you for baptism, I need you to come and talk to pastors tonight. Now look, pastors here at the Sequoia Center, every pastor I need to come to the front tonight. At the end of the meeting, if you need to talk to a pastor about your baptism, if you haven't had a chance to do that, if somebody has slipped through the cracks, we don't want that to happen. You're precious to us and precious to Christ. Just come forward, talk to the pastors. Let's pray right now, next meeting, Friday night. Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus. We give our lives to you tonight and thank you for his truth in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, a movement of God that you've raised up in the Adventist people. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.